So should we do a, a, a just a quick round of sort of uh, maybe a interview-ish style sure, impromptu? Sure. Stuff? I'll, I'll just come around. Um, when you mentioned that you were really a TV addict as a kid, and, and basically I guess that never really ends, so you said you're still a TV addict in what? Not and, using. Okay, okay. <laughs> Not using. And at the same time you said you made the TV be gone. So is the TV be gone, was that a therapy for you? Was it a therapeutical oh, project? Really. Yeah, so TV has this huge power over me and everyone, really. Uh -huh. uh, all my life, uh, TV has had this huge power over me, and now I have power over it. <laughs> I see, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I definitely see the sort of power it has over people when you go to the sports park, you just go like over there and they just space out and they don't look at you. Um, so what was your, uh, I'd say, uh, most successful use of TVB Gone? Use of it? Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a particular use. I mean, just making it and putting it out there is, is pretty uh -huh. amazing because it gives people a tool for thinking about TV and its power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, TV and its effects individually and collectively. And so, so even if way, people don't buy it, mm -hmm. just knowing that it exists yeah. gives people uh, a way to think about things in a way they haven't thought of before. And <clears throat> that's really why I put it out in the world. So I noticed here a lot of people were like just laughing the moment they heard the idea. Right? I think it's a very powerful thing. So in a way, it's more really a, a, a social commentary or a, an art piece or a, a concept art. Performance art. A performance art, yeah. OK, I see. Um, and yet it does work. You know, I've sold a half a million of these things. <laughs> really? Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Congratulations. So, um, I th one step that I thought was really interesting in your path, you know, along all these failures leading to these surprising successes, I guess, success failures, uh, was you, you mentioned grant writing. And, you know, my ears pricked up because I'm like, ooh, he discovered the wonderful world of science and the research. and. Uh, uh, and then he said, ah, well, that sucked too, so I stopped doing it. Um, so my question at that point would be, do you see a way that you could imagine changing that process or that, that way of you know, how society basically makes, makes research happen, um, this whole grant writing thing? What would be your suggestion to change that process? Would you just tell all the researchers, you know, quit your job, stop being a researcher, just do what you love, uh, which I guess is always a great option, I like it. But is there a way to maybe foster that and say, you know, there's, there's a pot of money that society has set aside saying we want this to be spent on research where there's no immediate result, da -da -da. and here's the people who are eager doing it. So what's your suggestion of... Well, I would hope that the people doing the research love the research for doing it. Uh, because you know, if they don't love it, then they're not going to be doing very good research in it. But if they love it, they're going to be discovering all sorts of things and noticing things they wouldn't notice if they were just doing this because they have to get out of bed mm -hmm. to go to work to get paid so they can crawl into bed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, how do you fund this kind of research? A lot of research does cost a lot of money. A lot of research doesn't, though. Mm -hmm. You know, this was you know, TV Gone wasn't uh, rocket science, right? Um, right. But there, it was a year and a half process of research and development. Dedication to it, anyway. Yeah, because you loved what you're doing. I totally loved what I did, mm -hmm. uh, and there are resources available um, that uh, you know, and especially if we pool our resources together. And this is one of the things we do at Hackerspaces, uh, and hopefully at more and more at schools as time goes on. Uh, we pool our resources together and we can do so much more than we can do on our own. Mm -hmm. So there are bio hacker spaces, which uh, are all over the world. Normally doing, uh, setting up a bio research facility costs hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And many people in the United States have set up spaces for like $30,000. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of places that uh, if something gets old, they just pitch it because in order to use grant money, they've got to use it all and then get it to the next round. And then they just throw something away and people have discovered this and just grab it for free. Mm -hmm. And they're perfectly usable. Um, there's a, a lab in Paris that's started basically for almost no euros whatsoever. And they've got an incredible setup, La Payasse. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there are ways of doing research without 
huge amounts of euros or dollars or mm -hmm. currency. So there's nothing wrong with that. Like when I was saying I didn't like grant writing, I didn't mean to say grant writing sucks. I mean, there's some people I know who actually love grant writing. Yeah, I'd say it sucks. I mean, I'm with you with that one. So, um. yeah, it sucks for me. <laughs> I didn't like it. Right, right. But uh, yeah, so that's not what I wanted to put my time and effort into. But if someone else did a grant for me to do something that I love, I would see nothing wrong with that. Just mm -hmm. a question: what, what is grant writing? Oh, it means writing a proposal uh, to a funding agency like the uh, okay. BMBF or the EU yeah. to give you money for research you want to do. Okay. Sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. Or an art project or whatever. Yeah, could be anything, um, could be scientific, artistic, whatever. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, I, uh, because we are also, in the, the European system tended to be highly sort of base funded, so if you became a professor here, you basically get a bunch of money and you were trusted to do the right thing. And this is changing over the last decade or so, it has really shifted towards more and more having to apply for every euro you want to spend. Kind of like it is in the US already, where you basically get no base funding and you have to apply for every single penny. Um, and, and the term that I, um, I came up with when, the, when we're sitting over like a couple different calls for writing these grants was, there's a measure which we call kilo euros per A4 page. So how many thousands of euros will you get for a grant that needs how many pages of content? Which is, of course, a terrible situation, right? If you're wondering, like, how many euros am I making by filling that page? But that's, that's unfortunately... It shouldn't be what, about the money. Yeah, yeah, right. It shouldn't be, but then it, it tends to be because that's what, the, uh, what folks here are being paid for. So it's an interesting tension that we're seeing. It used to be easier, or it would be easier, for example, if there was less of proposal-based funding and more of a funding that you know, gets to institutions um, after people have been sort of qualified and hired. Mm. But who knows? Yeah, well, when people are motivated by the money, they're going to be making many different decisions than they would make if they were doing things based on what they were truly interested yeah. in. Yeah. And, um, and this is why, especially in my country, that uh, people are, a uh, majority of people in the economy are working on things for the military rather than something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Because that's mm -hmm. where the money is. Mm -hmm. They're just going for it. And in, in fact, uh, the US military has been throwing money at hackers and hacker spaces hoping to get some of that magic, and it's, of course, not working. Mm -hmm. Can't buy that. But people are doing that, and they're changing what they do. They're not doing what they love anymore. They're doing stuff for the money, mm -hmm. and making things that hurt and kill and destroy yeah. in the process. Yeah. I was very surprised to hear about the make involved in, in, in yeah. like, getting military funding. It's pretty sad. Yeah, it's kind of very far away from what they usually stand for. Yeah, and it's of course not what they all stand for, but there are there is military at Maker Fair, there has been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that also struck me is it seems really you were touching on a lot of activities that are actually not that unusual in a university context. The second thing you were mentioning that you were doing and discovered you were enjoying and then did more and more of and you kept getting mobbed was essentially teaching. Um, so do you think uh, do you think that you love being a teacher because of that particular thing that you're doing, or do you think it is more an innate interest of, of being a teacher? Both and more. Um, I love teaching. Uh, people, I mean, that's what we do as humans. We, 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 we figure stuff out and we share it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've done since we've been on the planet. That's part of the reason why we survived as a species. Mm -hmm. And some people are better at the sharing part. Uh, other people are better at the coming up with ideas part, some people are better at both, um, and uh, some people are quicker learners, and we all have various skills and activities, but teaching, I love playing that role of um, uh, showing people that they can do things that they didn't imagine they could do, mm -hmm. uh, letting light bulbs you know, light up above people's heads, and, or in people's heads, and um, I love helping people. Mm -hmm. And when I teach, I want people to do what they want to do with it, rather than to absorb all of the information exactly as I present it so they can carry it back on a test, right. which is what I had to do when I was teaching at a, a, a university level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which teaching, that's, I guess you call that teaching, especially in the United States, but uh, it seems like it can be more useful than all that. Uh -huh. 
Which, so, yeah, which, which actually brings up an interesting question. Uh, you were telling us a lot and sharing a lot about sort of your personal development here, but um, what kind of roles were you filling in between? You were mentioning that at some point you were, you had founded a company. At some other point, I just heard between the lines here, you were actually teaching. Um, what other things are there in your your path? What kind of sort of I don't know professions, occupations, or things did you end up doing on your way to get to where you are now? Because that might be interesting to understand. Yeah, well, um, as a little kid, I knew I didn't want a real job. Uh, I saw <laughs> my father do it, and all of his friends, and they all looked exactly the same. They all got out of, got out of bed and then made themselves go to the commuter train, and then came home hungry and stressed out and like that doesn't look like a life I want to live so I um, thought there must be a better way and I was good at school so I thought it would be really cool to uh, go into academics mm -hmm. and um, uh, undergrad was great and when I was an undergrad it wasn't very expensive so I could go and go and go and take more classes and put off get graduating and I did it for five and a half years rather than the normal four uh, and then that, I finally had to get a degree, so then I had to get a graduate degree if I wanted to continue. And grad school was not nearly as fun for me. It was actually getting in the way of what I wanted to learn, along with some things I did want to learn. But the main thing it provided was the environment, people, this one lab that actually didn't do any military work, and therefore we were the one lab that did fun things like music synthesis and robots and flying machines. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, so it just got to be getting in the way of what I wanted to learn because it was so much effort to teach, do research, take classes, etc. And so I went into teaching. And um, uh, that was incredibly rewarding, but dealing with all of the administration and the tests and uh, also working 100 hours a week to be as good a teacher as I could be for every one of my 100 plus students. Uh, Wow, that was a uh, 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 recipe for burnout. Mm -hmm. So I burned out well, but um, and then I got a job uh, that I didn't like in Boston and doing museum exhibits, which were really cool. But uh, after a while, the technology behind the exhibits was exactly the same, whether it was for a Holocaust museum or a, a linoleum flooring kiosk in a mall. <laughs> <laughs> and that's mostly what it was being used for. And so I quit that and, uh, um, uh, yeah, through a number of kind of uh, circuitous steps, ended up finding that I could be a consultant mm -hmm. for small companies. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's what I did for most of my adult life until actually quitting that and doing that experiment that I described yeah. to see what, uh, you know, if I can find a way to make a living that I love. But doing the consulting was pretty cool. You know, I couldn't make enough money in a few months to live the rest of the year mm -hmm. and do lots of other cool things. But it was intense. I mean, being a consultant, you've got to be really good and put all your effort into it and follow through and, uh, yeah. And you constantly good. find new work as well, but so. Yeah, because mm -hmm. if you're good at it, people recommend you and then mm -hmm. they recommend you and pretty soon you have to say no. And I found the more I said no, the more people were willing to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's, yeah. Um, but yeah, as cool as that was, I wanted more, uh, I wanted to work on projects that thrilled me mm -hmm. and not just working on a project that would possibly give someone else profit. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that, but it just wasn't motivating for me. Yeah. So your undergraduate degree, was that in programming or? or oh, in electronics. Or electronics. Yeah. Yeah. And that was also what you ended up teaching them for a little while? Basically. Yeah, teaching um, physics, math, uh, electronics, digital, mm -hmm. beginning. Mm. Great, uh, great CV. Um, questions from you guys? Anything? What was uh, um, the difficultest um, thing uh, making the, this uh, development for one and a half year for the TV Begone? Well, I mentioned just a little bit of it. Uh, getting the off codes was actually quite a complex pro uh, problem to solve. Um, you know, it's, uh, Conceptually, it's really easy. You just blink a light on and off to make an off code for a Sony TV. And then you do it for a Philips TV. And then you do it for Samsung and LG and Fujitsu and Toshiba, etc., etc., etc. But uh, a lot of TVs have codes that are the same. 
And it turns out they're not off codes, they're power codes. You know, if you take a remote control, uh, you press the power button, a uh, TV that's off turns on. Press that same button, the same code comes out, it turns the TV off. That same button again, the same code comes out, it turns it on again. So it's really a toggle command. Mm -hmm. And I don't want toggle, I want off. <laughs> so if I have the same code in the sequence here and then a few seconds later here, it'll turn the TV back on. We can't have that. <laughs> so, uh, but that's actually, in some of recording all of these codes and there's lots and lots and lots of data, how do you wade through that? I had to write software to uh, interpret the data. And then, not only that, but this TV here has a code which is similar to this one. It's exactly the same except that all of the timing parameters are 10% longer. Is that the same? The only way to find out is to go out and do field testing. That takes a lot of time. Fortunately, it's fun to field test. <laughs> so, um, but it take, takes time. So getting rid of all of the duplicates and near duplicates is what took a long time. And in order to do that, I had to be able to record from the universal remote controls, which meant I had to make my own data acquisition system, my own logic analyzer, which took me three months. Fortunately, the company that I started, Freeware, that I mentioned in my little talk, um, I did the firmware for this controller card, and uh, I could hack that to be a logic analyzer, which I did. So otherwise, it would have taken longer. Yeah, there are a whole bunch of things. You know, like when you make a product, and I, I figured I'd, I'd make it a product because I didn't sell 5,000 uh, to break even, um, but uh, you need a barcode. Have you ever thought about barcodes? Where do you get a barcode? <laughs> well, it turns out there's the uh, Universal Code Council. And you have to pay them, and then, you know, whatever. There's lots of things to think about that you wouldn't think about uh, if you've never made a, your own product before. And it all takes time. So when you follow through on a project, that, like an idea that you really love, like the TV gone, what you just mentioned, like the barcodes, for example, it's, it's, I think it's a great example for something that actually then starts being not so much fun. Or another example you gave was the teaching you really enjoyed, but the administrative crap and the testing wasn't, wasn't so enjoyable. Um, so what's your recipe for uh, that? Do, do you think that's like almost something you can't really, es is it something you can't really escape and then you just need to move <coughs> to a new project so you can start again with the stuff you love? Or, you know, there's no one magic answer to that, but the thing is life it is inescapable. I mean, life is full of ups and downs. There's no escaping life having ups and downs. Um, but if you're doing what you love, the ups are way up, you know, and it's continual for while you're doing what you love. But no matter what, uh, like to do TV Be Gone, I've got to run a business, which means I've got to answer lots and lots and lots of email. I get hundreds of emails a day, and that takes lots of time, and I don't love spending my time on email, and I have to deal with uh, bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. It was okay, but I don't love it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then there's times when things are really stressful and uh, there's a cash crunch situation and how do you deal with that? And I don't love being stressed out. Um, but dealing with all of those things makes all of the rest possible mm -hmm. and all the rest I love. So it balances out for me, no question. Whereas uh, with teaching, it didn't balance out for me. With other people, it might. Because, you know, just because it... Uh, it didn't bounce out for me, doesn't mean it won't for someone else. And I love teaching still, and I, I, I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just not doing it in an academic environment very often, although here I am in a university. And I often am. And uh, I was just a hacker in residence at the University of Illinois where I went to school. And I was talking with lots of professors there who are very interested in putting changing their curricula so that there's more and more play-based learning involved. Yeah. And uh, more of that for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I could get away with more of that when I was teaching, maybe I'd still be teaching at that school. I was, I was surprised hearing your basic recommendations for people. Uh, it's very close to what I typically talk to students about when they say, I want to do my thesis at your lab, at your chair. I want to do this and this because I think industry is really interested in this kind of thing. You know, I want to program like SAP input mass because I know industry really needs it. I'm like, Jesus, no. 
use the time when you're a student, and especially for your thesis, do something that you really love, that you really you know get out of bed in the morning. It's like, wow, this is super exciting. Because <laughs> like you said, the ups are way up, and even the downs are bearable, and you'll be able to tunnel through the inevitable sort of you know flat lines 